lot of new guys come in when when it sounds right. Yeah. Okay. I'll do this standing up because it's a more standing up. Late January. Dry and freezing was nearly ready to hand it over to cold and slushy February when we snuck up the weed-choked fence that had barred the way to the overgrown remains of the station. It was just across the road from its big and chunky brutalist replacement, Smedic Colton Bridge. Beyond the face fence was a pathway, also mostly overgrown, leading down the side of a wooded cutting to the eastbound platform. It was Sunday, close to midnight. Both Dave's, Dad and Calper were getting too old for this sort of stuff. No use telling that, them that though. There were plenty of pained noises. Truth clacked snarls from Dad. Louder. Oh, bugger it! From Dave. As we helped them over the fence. We couldn't have done it without Eve and three or four of her sturdier girls from the unit. True to form, Dad tried charming up, turning the charm on with one of these, and unpredictably to everyone but to him, to Ethan, to me, he seemed to have a success. He still went to the it, the randy old bugger. And this was a lass who could bend a steel bar and each thing. Ith would be warning her off him at the end of the night. And with their help, we got things mostly ready, including three car batteries and Neil, sitting on a black Marshall monolith, far too big to be mistaken for a practice amp, was already tuning up. Ith shot him a dirty look that demanded the thing be turned right down. He complied. People did with this. We were mostly dressed in camo or black. I went quiet, went quiet when anything drove by. There was a dark polythene marquee to keep the rain off and just enough low level lights to work with. These lights gave everything a warm, drizzle jeweled glow. Between the marquee and the tracks, we'd set up a big black windbreak so, with luck, the driver of any goods train wouldn't register us if he was concentrating on the tracks. Relief when Andy and Dougie were able to take the two transit vans we'd used to a nearby parking space. They were back in under five minutes. Now, at last, we've made ourselves sufficiently inconspicuous. Of course, it was a tiny audience. Dad, Eve, and her mates. Seven people, said Andy. We've had four smaller crowds at the fizzle. Everybody ready? Croaked Dave, looking up from his tuning. Dougie was twisting his snare a bit, but he soon got that sorted. He brought a small kit, a snare, a floor tom, a high hat and a crash suit. He got to the stage where he could do quite a bit with just those. Intricate pulse he started on the top assured us this was going to be a good one. Are we recording this? Neil asked. I nodded at the little bat machine I had set up. Dougie went back to the pulse. And his eyes fixed on him rigidly. Then he put down the flute he'd been holding and picked up a a bigger bass flute. He made a long, sad noise. 
I turned to my cork and brought up a sample I'd not used much. It made me nervous. I got it from what was perhaps the last cassette tape recorded by Martin Iceman. It was a noise that through Martin's son had given birth to the paintings on the walls of the house where Charlotte had grown up. The noise that had, with those paintings, turned her father into Satan, and in doing so, given birth to the grey shirts. It was the sound of the wind in the branches of Cali Wood. Neil's response was almost tentative. He wouldn't want to try explaining to the missus what was going on here. Dave was more reassuring. There was a solidity, a reliability about the pattern he established that meshed with Dougie's more complex pulse. It almost seemed to hold my hand, which I almost seemed to need. And even when both of them joined Neil and Andy in their looser abstractions, I could still feel that pulse. But the sound of that wind across the tracks, around the end of the windbreak, I could just make out the concrete passenger shelter on what was left of the westbound platform. The roof had partly collapsed, and it was a desolate sight by day. By night, you'd not have noticed it if you weren't looking. I was looking. The darkness within was the darkness I'd been seeking. It was a special violent day. One anyone sane would have fled from. But I wanted it. I wanted it because I knew I had to get through it. I had to get through it because I needed to reach. Time stopped. Completely. It happened between one of Dog Dougie's beats on the top and the next. But it was an eternity. And something in the darkness, in the collapsed shelter, folded in on itself, then opened out. And I saw... I saw a sitting room. In a flat, I thought, because it was on a first or second floor. I knew, somehow, that it wasn't very far from here. Somewhere to the southwest, three adults and an infant, a tiny baby in a crib. Two of the adults were in their twenties, perhaps, or thirties. It seemed they were a couple. She was slumped in a sofa, apparently unconscious. There was a black halo round her, an aura of terrible depression. The other woman was older. It was hard to work out how old, because her face was so set, so rigid. But her hair was grey, and her eyes were grey, and she was head holding a heavy rolling pin. And there was something wrong with her face. Something not quite symmetrical. But this asymmetry did not disguise her resemblance to the man who stood there as if poised between action and inaction. And I knew him. Tony Griefstick, Warren's father, and I was watching all this from a funny vantage point, as if I was somehow painted onto the headboard of the cab. 
the group that had the feel of an Aztec temple for a wicker man. Horribly, I got the sense of being the god to whom a sacrifice was about to be made, and I could scream all I liked, but I wanted no such sacrifice. My devotee could not hear. Suddenly, I knew there were two ways this was going to turn out. Two entirely contradictory, but equally real versions. And the older woman with the rolling pin was Tony's mother. And the tiny baby was Warren, who I had met in the graveyard as a man, the father of my boy, of my beautiful, beautiful boy, and Tony's mother, carrying the heavy rolling pin, was coming closer to the crib. What had been her name? I strained to visualize what I glimpsed, but largely, largely ignored on Dave's computer screen, the ancestry website. Janice Griefstick, nay, Janice Crovis, Janice Crovis, and I knew I hated her, and I knew I existed to destroy her. I must find a way of doing it even if she was already dead. That bitch, that slag, that evil piece of shit was the thing that would deny the existence of my beautiful boy! I was still playing the call. I was looking impressed. Quite the two. I wrenched some bitter lines from the lawn, and the wind in the branches became shrieks and snarls, and they were mine. The doggy started getting louder on the floor top, started hitting the crash more often, and I looked across the track again, but the vision was gone. It had told me what it needed to. I knew who I had to kill. The guys are trying to bring me back. Trying to get some structure into the thing, not just a riff or a bass line, but something complex and melodic that would show me the way home. I couldn't hear it. Couldn't hear it through the rush of all the Janice Crowley's blood I needed to spill. Couldn't hear it through all the Janice Crowley's guts I needed to rip out. The cold kept screaming for me. And through the dark at the back of the concrete shelter, I thought I saw a word. I couldn't make out what it was. I'd seen it before when on the train in bright daylight, but I'd forgotten. Some low note on the bass flute. Something to hold on to. I began to steer the core back into reality. Back into the person I wanted myself to be. The patterns on the top of the bass slow and simplify. My own gables and tempests were subsiding. There was only the flutes and the guitar and the melody. They found together was surprisingly simple, surprisingly sweet, as they brought us all home. Its arms were around me. They weren't the arms of she who had been my lover. They were impossibly strong and almost frighteningly dedicated to my protection. Lord! It was Dave. He was wiping the sweat from his bass strings with a yellow duster. Lord! His eyes looked as concerned as Ith's arms felt. You aren't meant to be a killer, Lord. There. He'd heard it in my play. Everybody had. 
don't think, Andy suggested, I don't think we should put this out anywhere. Not just yet. No, said Neil. Not just yet. I could feel if nod in agreement as she let me go. Inhaling, I realised how tightly she'd been holding me. I felt a rush of fury. I was Babylon Kyle, placed upon the earth to rip that big slack Janice Provis's guts out with my teeth <laughs> to taste the blood and the shit of her shredded entrails and to feel the splintered and ground up fragments of her bones on my tongue. on my shoulder and it felt like a green and yellow wire. For a moment I was free of vengeance, though I knew it had been charging me up again. Soon enough.